Um, um, then okay, recording in progress, got it, cool. Um, great, so let me just go ahead and share my screen and get situated. Um, please feel free to turn your cameras on. Definitely helps me out a little bit to know that I'm not just talking out into the Zoom void. Um, before I get started, just to the organizers, thank you so much for having me. Super excited to be here and to all of the attendees of Citro Hacks, congratulations for participating. Um, so exciting that that's how you're spending your weekend. I commend you all for that. Um, and I really hope that the hackathon has been going well so far um, and that you enjoy my little talk. So with that said, um, this is a talk called Saying Yes to Your STEM Passion. If the word passion scares you maybe a little bit, I'll definitely be unpacking that term a little bit in this talk. Um, and if you don't think of yourself as necessarily a STEM person, I'm here to say that if you're at the Tackathon in some capacity, that means that some part of you wants to be using STEM for good. So I beg to differ. Um, with all that said, let us now get on into it. So before I just start talking at you all for the next hour, allow me first to introduce myself just a little bit. So hello, my name is Izzy. I use she, her pronouns, and I am 18 years old. Um, my birthday is in a month from yesterday, so almost 19. Um, I am a graduate of LaGuardia Arts High School. That name rings a bell or two. That is because Timothy Chalamet, among others, went there. So that's one of my couple flexes that I, that I have. Um, I am a proud New Yorker. I was born and raised in Brooklyn. That's where I'm currently coming into you all from. Um, and I love New York so much that I decided to stay here for another four years and probably the rest of my life. Um, and I go to Barnard College of Columbia University where I am a rising sophomore majoring in computer science and minoring in education. I am also a former astrophysics researcher. I'll be talking a little bit about my research today. And if we have time at the end, happy to answer any questions. Where I'm at right now is that I'm super passionate about using tech to storytell, to express myself, and ultimately to make the world a better place, just like I think a lot of you all are. I'm also a very big girls in STEM advocate. I basically talk about the importance of making the STEM community a more inclusive space, especially for women and girls, but really anyone who isn't a white male who might think that the STEM world isn't for them. I'm here to show that it is, that you are needed in this space to all of you. You are so needed here. Thank you for, for bringing your brains and your ideas to this hackathon. And you know, I really encourage you all to continue to be a part of this community. Um, ultimately, my life goal as a person is to re-envision the way that we view STEM as a society. If you take, you write a list down of every single negative word that you've ever heard yourself or someone else associate with STEM, I want to rewrite those narratives and make it so that as a society, we're looking at STEM as something that's exciting, inclusive, vibrant, accessible, and all, you know, any negative word, let's replace it with a positive one. Um, and not just have the words, you know, let's make sure that these communities and these spaces actually are true to what we are, you know, these positive words that we're hoping them to be. So um, that's my big life goal. Uh, and um, I hope to spend the rest of my life making that a reality. So um, now you get to know a little bit about me. I hope that you are feeling excited to keep listening to me after that. Um, before I continue, I'd love to get to know you all a little bit. So if you are able and feel comfortable, if you want to drop your name, age, pronouns, current location, and what you're passionate about in the chat, that would be awesome just so that I get a little bit of a better understanding of who am I talking to today, um, and I'll be reading these out. So we'll take a couple minutes or so just so that we can respond in the chat. And I'm just putting out the disclaimer, reading names, not my thing. Um, and so we're going to do our best here. Um, but OK, we got Riley. Hi, Riley. You're from San Francisco. Dope city. Really I've been there a lot of times. Want to go again. Um, and you like web dev. Awesome. Me too. That's probably my biggest interest when it comes to CS. I'm a big web dev and design girl. So awesome. Thanks for being here. Hi, Marianne, who's from Maryland. Dope. You also like web dev squad. Looks like we have a bunch of web devers. Ooh, new term. Okay. In the house. Love it. Um, 
Hi, Daya. You're in Austin, Texas. Cool. And you love CS and astrophysics. Well, you are at a great place, Lynn, because those are the two things I'm about to talk about. Um, okay, we got Nathan uh, from LA, like CS squad. Seems to be a pattern here. Um, we got Harper, 13, and from Missouri. Oh my gosh, look at you. Wow, if I was doing this at 13 years old, I don't know where I'd be at in life, but probably better off than where I am right now. So awesome that you're here. Keep it up. That's amazing. Um, and you like web dev. Wow, is this, I'm into this. I'm glad that we're all into web dev over here. It's rare to I've asked this question like so many times, y'all, and I've never gotten so many people that have said web dev, but maybe it's because I'm talking in the hackathon. Um, okay, we got Amna, 17 from Pakistan. Awesome. Also likes web dev. Join the club. Amazing. Um, we got Alex. Hi, Alex. Thanks for the emoji. Um, we live in the Philippines. Dope. And you like science in general. That's awesome. That's, that's great. Uh, you can take a lot of science classes in your life. So dope that you don't have one in particular. Love to hear it. Um, okay, we got Aditya, who is 12. Oh my gosh, a 12-year-old from India. Wow, amazing. Um, and front-end developer. Dope, same, definitely my interest too. Awesome. Um, we got Megan, 16 from New York. Let's get it, same here. Coding and cybersecurity. I have a recommendation for you. You should follow Cyber Collective on Instagram. I know a bunch of the founders, all super dope, completely woman of color led research and community organization. Super duper cool. They post a lot of really dope stuff. I recommend subscribing to their newsletter. Just a quick shout out to Psycho is what people call them. Um, okay, let's see. We got Antonita, dope from Mexico, you like math, technology, science, looks like we got a big STEM homie over here in general, love it. Um, we got Ingrid from California, just getting into comp science coding, so no particular area yet. Well, that's great, good thing we're at, there's always, I only started really getting into coding like literally last summer when I had just turned seven or I just turned 18. So plenty of time to figure out what your interest really is. Um, and we got Julia, 16 from Canada, one of my best friends at school is from Canada and computer science. Awesome. Um, well, it looks like we've no more uh, chats are coming in. So I'm gonna take it that most of us who feel comfortable responding have responded. Thank you all for sharing uh, that information with me. I definitely feel like I've gotten to know uh, this audience better. Um, I love how web dev centered we all are, super into it. Um, and awesome, great. Uh, let us keep going here. So for my friend in the audience who's into astrophysics, that is where my whole story begins. So I basically spent my entire childhood dreaming of becoming an astrophysicist when I grew up. And I really mean from like the ripe age of eight, I declared that I was gonna be an astrophysicist one day. And I have vivid memories of being in, in elementary school. And you know, maybe this was just an American New York City school thing, I don't know. But I would get handed this big piece of paper, there'd be a rectangle and like three lines and my teacher would tell me to draw a picture of what I wanted to be when I grew up and write a sentence about it. And I'd always have to ask my teacher how to spell astrophysicist because I had no idea back then and honestly still mess it up now, but we're not gonna talk about that. Um, and as I just said, so I spent from age eight to age 17, astrophysics was basically my whole thing. Um, where my actual first moment with astrophysics started was I became mesmerized by the projected cosmos in the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. If that museum name sounds familiar to you, it is because it is the museum where the night of the museum movies were filmed, which is cool fun fact. Um, but I just remember sitting there, I'm lying back, I've never been to a planetarium, put it on your to-do list because it is one of the dopest experience ever. You feel like you lie back and above you, it just feels like you're floating around in the middle of the universe. So I remember lying there thinking to myself, oh my gosh, like people can spend their whole lives studying space. Okay, cool, count me in. And became really, really, really into space. 
And this passion that I had for astrophysics and space and STEM took me all throughout my childhood and eventually was the reason behind why I was able to obtain a astrophysics research internship in uh, the American Museum of Natural History's astrophysics department nine years later. So super honored and feel very grateful that I was able to have this full circle experience with where my passion started to where it was eventually able to lead me to all in the same museum. Really, really cool. Um, and I can talk more about my astrophysics research later, but for a little bit of a snippet on what we were doing, my team basically spent 10 months writing code in Python to analyze telescope images of brown dwarfs. If you don't know what a brown dwarf is, I know my astrophysics friend out there probably does, but you know what a planet is, you know what a star is, you basically know what a brown dwarf is. It kind of takes up this middle area between planets and stars. And by studying brown dwarfs, astronomers get to learn information about both. So dope celestial object to learn about. Um, and the tea was that my team actually discovered a brown dwarf 66 light years away and threw an error in our code. So for all of my CS folks, which is I think every single one of you, if I'm singling one of you out, I'm sorry. Um, I know y'all don't like those errors, but let this be a little omen of good vibes when it comes to errors, because the error you have might just enable you to discover a brown dwarf. So that's all I'm gonna say, um, but yeah, super cool story. Um, it turned out that this brown dwarf, uh, it was literally not in any astrophysics databases. Um, this brown dwarf didn't exist on any of them. So that's how we knew that it was not known to the public that this that this uh, celestial object exists out there. And my team did a whole bunch of follow up. We did more, wrote a lot of calculations, more code to really make sure that our findings were accurate. And then we ended up putting together a really fancy, sophisticated paper poster uh, and talk um, to share our findings with the world. So super cool stuff. Now, maybe you're thinking to myself, oh my gosh, like this girl discovered an object in space. Like, is she a genius or something? Absolutely not, y'all. If someone from the future ran up to little eight-year-old me and told me that not only would I conduct astrophysics research as a high schooler, but that I would discover an object in space 17 years later, or uh, sorry, as a 17 year old, I promise you there is literally no way I would have believed them. Once again, there is no way I would have believed them. But um, what I had that I really think of as kind of the backbone of what this whole talk is about and really the backbone of my story uh, as a person is that I grew up with my mom who infinitely supported my passion, encouraging and reminding me that I can be anything I wanted to be in the world of STEM or beyond. So when I said that I wanted to be an astrophysicist, my mom took on this goal, this dream as if it were her own. Um, and so growing up, there was never any question of do I have what it takes to be an astrophysicist? My mom believed in my abilities wholeheartedly and that really did make me believe in them too. And it is really, really good that I did get to have my mom to be that backbone, be that support system for me, because middle school hit me like a truck. I believe that we have a 12-year-old or two and some 13-year-olds in the audience. I don't know if y'all are in middle school. If you're not in the States, maybe it's, I don't know what the ages are. Um, but middle school for me was not my jam, y'all. But it starts off pretty well. I actually get into middle school and I'm kind of slaying the game. I end up getting a 99.17 average, which enabled me to be placed first on the high honor roll. And that is still one of my biggest flexes. Um, I have never done as well in school as I did in sixth grade. Don't know what was going on when I was 11 years old. Maybe I didn't have the weight of the world's problems on my back, was too ignorant to know they existed yet. I don't really know, but for some reason, I am just slaying the game at the beginning of middle school. So that's why this story becomes a little bit more depressing because I did start off strong, but my first big obstacle was seventh grade math. So I take a massive L 
Now I came in to this math class. This is my seventh grade advanced math class. And I come in and I'm thinking, you know what? Like I'm an advanced math. I can do the damn thing. Like I'm good at math. Uh, yada, yada, yada. I was really good at math in fifth grade. I was placed at table six, which was the highest in my class. Took a lot of pride in being good at math, which was why it was really weird when on the first exam, I get a 64. Now, this test was not particularly challenging. In fact, the majority of my class did, in fact, get a 90 on it, so or above. So I was a little bit confused. Definitely one of, I don't think the term bra moment existed back then, but major bra moment for me. But I very quickly understood the vibes. I said to myself, you know what? Okay, cool. This class is going to be more challenging for me. That's just the way it's going to be. I can do it. I still believe in myself. So I basically go home that day after school and I tell my parents that I want to get a math tutor. They get me a math tutor and I spend the entirety of seventh grade getting better at this class. It was hard for me, but I put in the work. I met with my tutor every single week so that by the end of the year, I was getting grades on exams in the 90s. I was, I was doing decent. I was doing well. I was doing really well. Um, but that was not, it was not enough for some people, um, specifically my teacher. So we're not going to use his real name for legality reasons, but we're going to call him Mr. O. And Mr. O and I just didn't get along from the start. His teaching style just like really didn't vibe with the way I work as a person. He was all like, I'm going to teach you nothing and you're going to go figure it out. And like, maybe that's some of your vibes. It's not mine. Y'all need to tell me what to do and I'll do a really good job of it. But I get like, if I don't know what's happening, I just, I can't hang. So we never really vibed and his teaching style just really didn't work for me, which is why I had to rely on my math tutor pretty heavily. Anyways, he asked to speak with me after class one day towards the end of seventh grade, and I come outside with him, and he has my progress report in his hand. And, you know, he's kind of giving me this whole talk. He's talking about, he tells me that I got an 86, that my average in the class right now is an 86. In order to be eligible to stay in advanced math for eighth grade, you need to get an 85 or above average. So I was eligible. But he's kind of going on this whole rant and eventually says to me, I strongly encourage you to drop out of advanced math. And this just broke my heart. Um, not only did he not make a single comment commending me for, for sticking with this class in the first place, for putting in the work, for actually doing pretty well on tests by the end of the year, um, all he could think about was compared to other students in my class, that I was gonna be at a severe disadvantage for eighth grade and that it was ultimately a safer decision and a, and a smarter decision for me to not continue on the advanced uh, placement track. So that sucked, um, it really sucked. And I remember this conversation as if it was yesterday and I'm almost 19 now and this happened when I was 12 years old. And this sounds pretty bad. You're like, oh my God, that's her sad story. Yes, and now she's a steminist. Oh my gosh, no. So it gets a lot worse. Um, this happened on hey, Thursday. And then the next day was the day that we were finding out if we got into advanced science for eighth grade. Now, I don't know if y'all are getting the vibes too well, but like my class was hella smart for like no type of reason. Everyone was really good at both math and science. And I thought of myself as good at those classes as well. All throughout seventh grade, I did pretty well on my on my science tests. Um, but uh, there was one test that really mattered the most. And this was the placement test uh, to see if you got into advanced science. And that was the test that ultimately had the most weight on this decision of whether or not students should take advanced science for eighth grade. And, you know, I had done well all year. So I was thinking to myself, you know what? I got it in the bag. I'm obviously going to get a letter telling me that I got into advanced science. So it's a Friday. The lights are dim. Everyone is lined up in front of my homeroom teacher who's holding a big stack of envelopes that have all of our letters telling us, congratulations, you got into advanced science, yada, yada, yada. And I happened to be the last person online. And I think there was this very movie-like scene. I kind of turn around and then I have my hands outstretched, expecting an envelope in them. Uh, when in fact, um, I take a massive L again, and it appears that uh, there was no envelope to be found for me. And my homeroom teacher 
says to me, sorry, Isabel, we don't seem to have a letter for you. So I am like, yo, what the heck is going on? The day before my teacher, my math teacher saw like no advanced math for you, now no advanced science for you. And I am having a moment, y'all. I end up leaving that classroom, sobbing, really like walking around the halls of my middle school, thinking to myself, what is wrong with me? How am I not doing well in seventh grade math and science? The T is that I found out a couple of weeks later that I actually failed the test to get into advanced science, um, even though I had done one all year in the actual like, you know, regular class in, in class tests, the big exam. Yeah, I failed that. So uh, the, the bigger T, the harder T, let's say, is that I actually have severe testing anxiety that was never diagnosed because everyone thought of me as the really smart kid growing up. And maybe some of you resonate with that, but that's a different talk. Anyways, as I was saying, I am having a moment as I am walking around the halls of middle school. And I'm thinking to myself, how the heck am I going to become an astrophysicist one day if I can't even do well in seventh grade math and science? And I'm telling this story with a lot of humor in it because that's how I cope with problems. Um, but at the end of the day, this was a really terrible, terrible moment for me. Um, and I'm so much older now, and I still, I mean, I have a pretty good memory too, but I really, I remember how it, how it felt to walk around the Halls Middle School and, and really just question my intelligence, question my worth, question what the heck am I doing with this big, crazy dream of one day wanting to discover something in space if I'm literally failing <laughs> tests in seventh grade math and science classes. Um, and it was a really... Um, memorable moment in my life. Um, but then something began to change. And what changed was that I remembered my passion. And I've always been a very self-aware kid. I've always been someone that like kind of had this bigger world view, kind of even in moments of, of deep, deep distress. And I really remember thinking to myself, like, wait a second, like, I'm not taking these math and science classes because I care about being the best in the class in them. I'm taking them because I genuinely really like math and science. I care about how I do in them because I care about the subjects. I care about actually learning them. And I want to be able to one day use my, my likings for math and science to become an astrophysicist. So I came home that day after school and I had kind of gotten myself together a little bit, was, but was still pretty shaken up from, you know, the double whammy of no that I was getting from the universe. But I still came home that day after school to my mom continuing to be there, continuing to hype me up, continuing to remind me that, of course, I can be an astrophysicist. What is seventh grade math and science going to matter in the long run of things? Um, and really having my mom be there to, to vocally cheer me on was such a big reason why I was able to stick with this path. And it is so crazy now to look back on my time in middle school and, and what I've been able to accomplish since then and think that it's the same girl, the girl who didn't think that she was smart enough to be an astrophysicist is the same girl who discovered an object in space only five years later. So what this really gets at is the power of passion. If I had let my math teacher or my lack of letter from my homeroom teacher telling me I got into advanced science, if I had let those moments take power over me and listen to them and, and said to myself, you know what, maybe, yeah, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I should listen. Maybe math and science just aren't my thing. If I had let myself go down that path, let myself be taken over by the no's that were surrounding me in those moments, there's absolutely no way I would still be pursuing this whole STEM thing. And really what it was, was that I had this deeper passion, this deeper, this deeper dream that was embedded inside of me, that was vocally supported by people around me, such as my mom, that made it so that I continued to listen to it, made it so that I was able to shut out the no's that were coming at me and listen to this passion that I had and continue to pursue it. And this is why I say that in moments of fear and doubt, it is your passion 
that grounds you and reminds you why you're here. And I really did continue to stick with it. I stuck with advanced math for eighth grade. I stuck with advanced math all throughout high school. I went from uh, trigonometry, I skipped pre-calc, I skipped regular calc, I went straight to AP Calculus AB and got a five on the exam, continued to take advanced math in uh, senior year, did pretty well on in the class and on the AP exam, continued to stick with science. I didn't end up getting into advanced science for eighth grade, but no worries. I still stuck with science. I took because I wanted to be an astrophysicist at the time, took as many physics related classes as I could, took AP physics my senior year of high school and really continued to, to let my interest in these classes guide me to the point where I was able to get that astrophysics research internship. So before I just, before I move on to talking to my mom for a second, I really just want to, to really make you guys understand that like in no way was I someone that grew up taking W after W, every single thing went my way always. And that's why I was able to get that internship one day. It was really so much more that I kept having these, these moments of real struggle in these classes, but that what was what revealed itself to be so much more powerful and guiding in my life was the fact that I had a bigger why, was the fact that I was determined to become an astrophysicist one day. And I let that passion listen. I let myself listen to that passion. I let myself say yes to that STEM passion. And it's done a lot of good stuff for me. So really the backbone behind why I was able to say yes is that I had my mom. And I think it's pretty clear from this talk that my mom is very much my everything. But um, during uh, my junior year of high school, my mom passed away following a 14 year battle with stage four breast cancer. So obviously this changed my life in many more ways than I would ever be able to, to fit into a slideshow. But one of the most profound ways it changed my life was that it made me really think a lot about how I grew up, how I was raised, um, and what I ultimately wanted to do with, with my life and how I thought that I could be most useful um, in the world. And when she passed away, I really, for the first time in my life, recognized the privilege of growing up with a powerful woman role model who always encouraged me to pursue STEM. I thought about how that's honestly pretty rare that unfortunately so many other young girls don't grow up with that same role model to constantly cheer them on. And that was when I decided that that was what I wanted to do, that that was who I wanted to be that I wanted to be a role model or a friend or and or and and all of the above, a cheerleader for girls in STEM worldwide. So it was when I kind of took on this, this deeper why of why I want to be pursuing STEM and, and what the larger implications of that is, was when I began to proudly share my passions for STEM with the world, hoping that it would inspire more girls to explore and pursue their own STEM passions. Ultimately, I envision a world where girls are exposed to STEM from a young age and guided by women role models all throughout their K through 12 educations. I envision an inclusive STEM community that welcomes women and girls of all races, abilities, sexual orientations, and socioeconomic backgrounds to use their STEM superpowers to change the world. And just a little asterisk there, this is a vision that is inclusive to every single person. Um, I focus particularly on girls because I am a girl myself. My story is based on my lived experience of growing up as a girl in STEM. But for real, everything that I ever advocate for is for any, it's, it's, it's my hope is that it resonates with any person who's ever doubted themselves in STEM. And my hope is that it reminds them that they can do this, that there's people out there to support them and that I am, that I am part of those people. Ultimately, this vision, I really do plan to spend my entire life making a reality, figuring out how to go about that as I grow up. Um, and I really hope that each and every single one of you will join me. 
And I think the fact that you're at this hackathon, that you're participating and using tech for social good, that tells me that you're already a part of this vision, that you're already working with me to make this vision a reality. So I already see you all as my collaborators of this vision that we're building together. Now, here is where I give my, maybe you can picture me in like a hat and tie, and then I have like a whiteboard, you know, they do the like infographic commercial things. Maybe I'm going on a tangent here, but I really want to make a note to say, to, to, just a note to talk about the concept of passion, because I think that it scares a lot of people sometimes. I kind of, that's one of the, um, I guess, not, not disagreements I get with some of the work that I do, but just that word, I think that people have a lot of feelings about it, and I just want to try to address those feelings. First and foremost, it's okay. Actually, it's more than okay. It's good. It's amazing. It's, it's wanted that uh, and for your passion to evolve and change and deepen as you get older and grow as a person. This is a little graphic I made. Uh, me over there at point A, that's me as an aspiring astrophysicist. If you ask me what my passion was, what I want to do with my life, from the ages of eight and 17, as you're all now aware, I would have told you that I wanted to be an astrophysicist when I grow up. Now, if I answer that question, I say that I am an aspiring computer scientist, an educator, a creative, a content creator, a designer, a community builder, a public speaker, a thought leader, to who knows what. And I'll be real with y'all, I changed, I'll, you know, I changed my slides around before I give any talk, but I often change this slide and I change some of those words in the second half of it, because for real, my passion is evolving every single day because I'm evolving every single day. So of course, the things that I want to do with my life are constantly changing and growing and deepening and all of the really good stuff. And, you know, these arrows that I included are purposefully not linear because I don't think that passion is linear. I don't think that career paths are linear. I think especially with Gen Z, we're all going to be having a very non-linear career path and just following where the where the passion takes us, hopefully. Um, and I think that the idea of a one set career path that when you're 25, you start doing one thing and you do it till you die. I think that that is really creepy and that we've all honestly been brainwashed into thinking that like that makes any type of sense but also that I think that our generation is just really breaking a lot of a lot of what's con been considered normal and traditional throughout humanity um, and really doing things differently and allowing for a lot more fluidity so I really see all of us as having multi-linear career paths and just following what takes us in the moment of where we're at currently. And of course, in the bottom there, I have those three question marks because I don't know what I'll be saying I'm passionate about doing tomorrow, in a week, in a month, in a year, in 10 years, who knows where I'll be. But what has really been key in, in enabling me to show up as the person I am today is whatever it is that I'm interested in right now, I embrace it wholeheartedly. I basically make it a part of my brand because life changes all the time. But if I'm passionate about something in the moment, the moment is right now, right? So I'm going to say yes to that. And I'm going to follow that. I'm going to see where that takes me. And if I had never said yes to that astrophysics passion, I wouldn't be at all of where I am, where I am today. I wouldn't have any of these other words listed on this second half of this slide here. So I think that it is so important to embrace whatever you are passionate about right now and follow that, pursue that, let that guide you, because it will take you to a lot of really incredible places. So regardless of how your STEM passion evolves, I really believe that it holds the power to change narratives, to change stereotypes, to change minds, and to ultimately change the world. I view STEM, oh my God, that was not a sentence. I view STEM as a tool to create change, which is why that it is so important that we have the inclusive STEM community so that we're able to build inclusive and innovative products, technology, services, businesses, any other word that fits in that category that actually resonates and meets the needs of the entire population. So this is why I believe that through STEM, we can build a more inclusive world. One of my favorite sentences of all time, your STEM passion is a superpower. So the question that I want to leave you all today with is how are you going to use your STEM passion to change the world? 
And I really want you all to write that down, to share it with the world. Maybe writing it down means just writing down this question, maybe in some big letters. If you have any like bullet journal fans out there, I don't know, do a calligraphy moment. But write down this question. Let it be something that you think about. And a little asterisk to the idea of changing the world. I think that I use that terminology or I use that syntax because I want to think it sounds inspiring and, and cool. But I think that really what I, I'm trying to get at by saying that is changing the world can mean making an impact in one person's life. It can mean doing something on your block, in your town, in your school, in anywhere. As long as you are using something that you care about to try to make the world the somewhere a better place or try to make someone's life a little bit better, that is you changing the world. Because I really believe that it's all the smaller scale things that when you look at the big picture, you're actually making a really big impact. So start small, think, think large. I definitely am someone who, who follows that mentality. Um, and I really believe that all of you here, if you're if you're at this hackathon, you're already doing the thing. Like you're already trying to make the world a better place in some capacity. So really what this whole talk is about is just continue where you're at right now. Keep doing what you're already doing. You're already on a great path. And let this talk be basically just a bunch of claps applauding you for the work that you're already doing and the work that you'll continue to do. Another way this question can be interpreted is write down the answer to it. If you heard me say, how are you going to use your STEM passion to change the world? And you immediately got an answer to that question. Amazing, that's absolutely fantastic. Write that down, let that be something that you embrace. If you're giving an introduction, maybe it's a job interview or a club application, I don't know, whatever y'all are up to these days. But embrace that as part of who you are, that you want to use, insert whatever it is to change the world. I think that if you say that to yourself enough times, you'll really start to believe that. So one last time to all of you, your STEM passion is a superpower. So how are you going to use your STEM passion to change the world? And that brings us to the end of my talk. I wanna thank you all so much for listening, uh, for joining me today. Um, I know that these workshops are like half optional. So thank you for, for listening to me and giving me the time to speak, to share my story with you all. I really appreciate it. And I hope that there's at least one thing that you can take from this and bring it into the rest of your life. Um, linked there or written there, all of my socials. Um, my name is Izzy Lapidus. That's used everywhere on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on TikTok. And my email is there at the bottom. Um, I'm definitely the most active on Instagram. If there's something from this talk that resonated with you, please DM me, say hi. I want to get to know you. Tell me what it is. Tell me what it's leaving you thinking about. I'd love to know. Um, if we have any LinkedIn stands out there, to be real with y'all, I really am not super into LinkedIn. I just like don't like anything that feels like the establishment telling me what to do don't like it, but I recognize that LinkedIn has its pros. So if you want to build out those connections, do your girl boss moment, go right ahead. Um, just shoot me a note, uh, connect with me, shoot me a note, and I'll definitely connect with you back um, in that note. Just say who you are, how you found me. Um, and if you like this talk, let me know. It'll make me feel good about myself. Um, and hopefully you did genuinely like it. Uh, I also have my TikTok there. Um, I don't use TikTok like that much, but maybe I'll, I'm trying to be more active on it over the summer and have some ideas for how to do that. And lastly, uh, at the bottom is my email, um, hello at izzylapidus.com. If you're ever interested in scheduling a mentorship call with me, I'd love to make time to make that happen. What I mean by that is you have a project, you have a question, you need advice, whatever it may be. If there's something that you think that my assistance could be helpful to you, please let me know. I would love to be helpful to you in any way that I can. Shoot me an email, propose some times that work for you and we can figure out a time for us to meet. Um, and once again, thank you so much for listening. And it appears that we do still have uh, a little bit of time, kind of a lot of time actually, before this workshop officially wraps up. It's cool to end early if y'all have other places to be, I totally understand. Um, but once again, my socials are all linked in the bottom as well if you 
forgot, but it's really my name, not too complicated. Um, here are some questions, some topics that I can speak on. Um, if none of these have anything that you're interested in asking about, anything else that you want to ask me about, I'd be happy to answer. Um, I really just want to be able to support you all on your journeys, whatever that may be. Um, I can talk about Barnard, applying to Barnard, why Barnard, and talk more about, I mentioned I went to LaGuardia. Yeah, that means I went to acting school my whole life, which is like, what? Like astrophysics, what? Ast you did acting? Yeah, kind of weird, um, but also very cool and very much the reason of why I'm the way I am today. Uh, anything college app related, had a bit of a doozy process there, but everything worked out really well in the end. So I'd be happy to see you on anything college app related. Um, if you were interested in my research, you want to know more about what the heck I was doing there, how we literally discovered an object in space, happy to answer any questions there. Maybe you want to know what keeps me motivated or up at night or how I get up in the morning. Some personal questions. We could go there if that's what you want. Um, if you are interested in what I'm pursuing at school, which is computer science and education, happy to answer any questions about that and why that combo. And maybe you just want some more life advice, some confidence and STEM advice, imposter syndrome, whatever it may be. I've experienced a lot um, and can definitely speak on a lot. So please just shoot away. Um, and I feel like y'all get the idea of what you can ask me on. Um, I'd rather be able to, to see your screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Um, okay. Um, so we have one question here. What were some fun STEM opportunities, clubs, programs, were you involved in high school and college? So as I said, I did go to an art school. Um, I also went to art school for middle school. So I've definitely been in uh, schools where the STEM in general just like hasn't really been uh, a lot of STEM opportunities weren't super offered to me, um, which ended up being uh, beneficial to me in the long run. I made it work. Um, in high school, um, there were a couple clubs. I joined our Girls Who Code Club. I kind of helped found it. Um, I also was a part of a robotics team. However, robotics team was kind of really sexist and, I, and also anti-Semitic. That's a different talk also. But I didn't really like the energy in the room. It was super not my vibe. So didn't really end up being a part of that community that much in the Girls Who Code Club. Like, was kind of not super active. Um, I was super involved in the online world of girls in STEM, mainly because my high school really didn't have many opportunities for me. The first online girls in STEM space I ever became a part of uh, was Girl Genius Magazine. If that name sounds at all familiar, I actually really do think of Girl Genius as like the beginning of kind of the movement of all of these like student led women in STEM related organizations. Girl Genius is awesome. I became friends with Shivali, the founder on like this weird app for like overachievers in high school. And like we connected and she was just starting Girl Genius at the time. There was only like less than 40 people that were working on the magazine, super, super small. I joined the team. I helped come out with our first couple of Instagram posts. I designed some of the first, the first thing I ever did was I was a layout designer um, and was a part of the launch of our first issue. And it was so amazing to just, I joined in the beginning of 2018 um, to just watch Girl Genius grow so much. And I think has done so much of bringing together girls in STEM across the world. So super cool. One of the most, um, what's the word, uh, forming experiences and, and communities I was ever really a part of in high school. Um, so shout out Girl Genius, big fan. Um, I also started an astronomy club at my high school, my senior year. I'll be real with y'all, like clubs and extracurriculars, we were already, I was at school from 8 a.m. to 4 on a day where I had no extracurriculars. Um, and if I had rehearsal, I was there till 730. People at LaGuardia are exhausted. We are doing the arts like all day on top of all of our academics. I had every, I had five academic classes a day. It's absurd. Like, I don't know how I functioned in high school. Um, so it was kind of hard to get people to be motivated. I was also like the STEM girl of my high school. Like there was some overlap between like people who were visual arts majors and liked math, but like I was the only person like in my entire school that liked astrophysics or that I was aware of at least. So I was definitely um, 
there just wasn't a lot of community at my school for my my STEM interest. Um, so that was why I was so much more active and really wanted to be active in these online spaces. Now in college, um, it's been hard with COVID. Uh, my school was not, I, I go to Barnard, as I said, there was no in-person classes. So it was hard to meet people. I've become very involved in the CS space at Barnard. Um, we're currently in the process of, of building our CS program in one day department. It's very much in startup mode. So I'm kind of one of the biggest uh, students involved in building the program, which is really cool. I'm also working on my own project called Building Up Barnard CS that is kind of like a research community based, uh, both um, gathering empirical evidence or data, but also stories and stuff, really just trying to ultimately answer the question of what does the future of Barnard CS look like in the way that meets the needs and wants of, of current and future Barnard students. Um, and I'm really working uh, and being very involved in Barnard's CS program, hoping that the, the way that in which this program is developed can then be replicated in other schools and other collegiate uh, CS spaces and into other schools, maybe that means K through 12 schools, which also have a really big gap in CS education. So I'm doing a lot of dope work there. Uh, but I'd say in terms of actual clubs at school, they're just, it's been pretty difficult just with COVID. So I've been more working on some of my own stuff. Um, one second. Sorry, I was getting a knock at my door. Um, so I'm sorry that I can't answer more in details of some of those other STEM opportunities. I think that, you know, I've kind of, I think the biggest one that obviously you already know all about is that I did have my astrophysics research internship. So I was at, I was at the museum a lot. I'd go there twice a week, sometimes three times a week, sitting at a computer, looking at data all, uh, for like two hours. So that was my biggest uh, way in which I was really involved in what I was interested in in high school. Um, Cool, so can you please talk about your arts background and how that can connect with STEM? Yeah, totally, I love this question. I'm so glad that it was asked. Um, I don't, it's not ever the focus of the talks that I give, even though it really like, I can say so much about this. Um, for a really long time, I thought of these interests as very, very, very separate. Um, the same age I was eight was also, when I, the same age I discovered my interest in STEM as an eight-year-old was also the same year I was put in my first uh, theater production. Um, I'm a Leo for my astrology babes out there. I like to be the center of attention. I like to be on stage. I always had a very like performancey personality. Um, so I started doing acting when I was eight years old. I was really into it. I then auditioned to get into my middle school, also in art school, went there, got obviously got in and went there for theater, then continued, got into my high school, which was LaGuardia, um, also audition based continue to do acting. So I was just kind of always doing acting and very much took it as kind of for granted, honestly, that this was just a part of my life. Um, I also grew up in a household that was very arts focused. I played piano since I was three years old. Um, my, I, was, I was, grew up listening to classical music and jazz music. My dad's a big music dude. He also does 5 million things that are all arts related. He is an incredibly talented watercolor painter. He's also a very talented New York City street photographer and also an epic poet, meaning that he writes poems, but they're like 300 pages long. Uh, as a child, I never went to anywhere tropical. I went to Florida for the first time when I was in high school with my friends. Um, my parents would take me to museums in Europe. I spent my childhood looking at art and had no appreciation for it back then, but in hindsight, I very much do. So I very much just grew up in a world where the arts were like much more my foundation, honestly, than STEM even was. And it took me a very long time to be able to understand that my whole way in which I present myself in STEM is so, so, so influenced by my background in the arts. The whole reason I'm able to give these talks and, and talk to you and not like freak out about the fact that I'm talking to strangers on the computer right now is the fact that I've, I've grown up acting and I've grown up being on stage in front of audiences that I don't necessarily know in the beginning um, and putting on a show, telling a story. So I very much see now, hopefully my continuing public speaking career in the world of STEM as probably the most influenced by my background in theater. But also I think that for me, 
so much of my interest in tech is the storytelling aspect. When I code a project, I take time to write in about the project and I explain its relevance and I explain why I chose to build this program in the way that I did and the purpose that it ultimately serves um, in my life and what I hope that it does for its users. So everything that I do is very much from a human centered perspective and humans and empathy and, and really just you know, expression, those are like the foundations of what art is all about. So for me, it was so hard for me to, I just saw these worlds as completely separate. But now as I've grown older, I've seen that so much of, of my interest in STEM is influenced by my, my background and, and interest in the arts. So um, I'd say that, you know, it really is kind of my, my a lot of, I guess, secret weapons, but um, a big secret, secret weapon of, of kind of how I continue to show up in this space um, and also the vision of what I hope the future of STEM looks and feels like. Um, okay, we have a couple more minutes. Um, what was the most important thing you learned during the transition from high school to college? Great question. So this is definitely more personal to me, but as I just said, I grew up going to art schools. So going to college was the first time in my life where I wasn't going to a school that was arts focused. And it was a huge, huge reality check for me or culture shock rather. Um, art school also means that there weren't a lot of sports at my schools um and now I interact with like Columbia ginormous football players like every day and like hate it here a little bit um not actually but huge culture shock um the fact that there's just so many sports around me and everyone's an athlete like that is so so foreign to me and how what my high school experience was like um and also just going to LaGuardia, going to an art school, a school that like is famous for the arts, everyone was there for a reason. Everyone was talented in some way, shape or form and creative more importantly, in some way, shape or form. And it's weird now to go to be in college and, and not have the arts be something that brings everybody together. So I'm definitely kind of on the hunt to find my arts people. Um, I made a deal with myself that if my schedule allows it, that I'm going to be taking one arts related class every single semester so that I'm still having that be a part of my life. Um, I'm also hoping to get a keyboard for my dorm in the fall uh, and for my sophomore year dorm. So really the biggest transition was just just learning that school is not always going to be art school, that if, if I want the arts to be a part of my life, I need to make that happen for myself and it won't be my environment that just like inherently hands that to me. Um, I guess a more general thing that probably more of you will be able to relate to is I'm telling you all right now, you are brainwashed for real, man. I thought that being productive was a part of my personality. Like literally I would describe myself as productive. That's crazy, y'all. Like that is internalized capitalism talking right there. And like, it is so important to be aware of how our society will like try to make us think you are not your work. You are never your work. You can be passionate about things. You can be really into things, but never to think that for a second that it is those things or it is that homework or it is that test or whatever that defines you. Um, I think that one of the biggest transitions for me is like just being able to, to understand that like doing work is not like a flex. Like it's not cute to be so busy all the time with all of these things you have to do. It sounds fun in high school. I literally, I, I live an hour, I lived an hour away from my high school. I would wake up at 5.45 in the morning and I would be on the train by 6, 15 ish doing homework. Like what the heck? Like I didn't even give myself like a second to wake up. So I think that like, it's really important when you're making this transition to college that now school is your whole, like, it's like college, we think of it like that's good, your entire education, that's continuation of school, yes. But you're at a place where like, if you are not able to make those distinctions, to make time for school, to make time 
for your friends to have a life to make time for laying on your bed doing nothing like you are in a place where like you just everything can kind of merge all together because you're living in the same place where you're going to school um so it's really important that you have these dialogues with yourself and that you say to yourself okay like let me make sure I'm having a, a, a a work-life balance. I don't love that term, but like having a balance between focusing on under work and things that, you know, some things just need to get done. So you're going to get them done, but being productive is not a flex. It's really, really, really not like I'm saying that and like listening to myself a second in playback, like actually hearing that because that's still something I'm, I'm working so hard to unlearn about myself. And I just feel like for so many high schoolers, we are really praised for for not sleeping for what we're all running on is called anxiety folks like I didn't know that I experienced anxiety until quarantine and until trying to start college the fall semester for me was terrible y'all like I was literally not okay it was really really difficult for me to start doing college work also for me just like for having things felt all of a sudden a lot more pressure because it's college and not high school so that my brain thought with pro procrastinating my work, um, which is just anxiety. So I think another thing I had to learn and another important transition is like, I think that there's at a lot of colleges, there's really incredible mental health support. It's really important that you ask for it, that you advocate for yourself. I probably asked for an extension on almost every single essay I wrote the entire year because life is still hard, even if it's going back to this new normal or whatever you want to say. So you just need to be real with yourself. It doesn't hurt. I mean, it only hurts yourself to be not sleeping or to be letting yourself have your work control your whole life or to be letting yourself fall behind your classes if they are feeling overwhelming. You really like, you've got to be real with yourself. You've got to talk to yourself. You've got to remind yourself who's boss here, who is boss of your life. That will always be you, y'all, always you. So I think when you're making this transition into adulthood, you just, you gotta, you gotta advocate for yourself and, and no one else is going to do it if, if you don't. So you might as well do it. Um, awesome. Okay. Well, it looks like we have only about two minutes. If anyone wants to ask a final question, please go right ahead. Um, if we don't want to do that just once again um all of on all socials you can find me at izzy lapidus i think i made it pretty clear that like i am really here to give my support if that's something that you want i did not have someone like me growing up um at all and there was no like person kind of my age that like kind of seemed like they knew it they were doing for me to talk to and I totally wish that there had been so that's so much of what I'm trying to be for any of you um not a question but I just want to say you're so pretty oh my god thank you um I have some pride clips in my hair happy pride also forgot to say that earlier I was I'm in New York City so there's a ton of pride that's happening um all over the city um super fun and awesome so happy pride to all of you as well um uh Ali was saying thank you for the compliment um but please like easiest way to reach me is on Instagram at Izzy Lapidus I will be there as soon as I'm able to respond um they're feeling bored you can always stalk me that's kind of fun um but yeah uh thank you so much for being here thanks so much for for listening to me talk for the past hour I really hope that something that I've said has resonated with you in some capacity um and I really hope you all have an amazing rest of your hackathon experience thank you uh, I want to say that was super inspirational and I think it's pretty incredible how you're like using your experience to empower girls in STEM. So thank you for your life advice. Of course, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we're happy to have you. All right, um, so our our closing ceremony has been moved to 630. So if there's nothing else, then I guess I'll see you guys there.